A WUSA 9 investigation and new reporting on the growing financial cost of the riots. Chief investigative reporter Eric Flack is asking how much will taxpayers have to shell out to prosecute the alleged insurrectionists? And how much will be spent defending the people accused of attacking the seat of our democracy? Back on January 6, 2021, we had democracy at its ugliest, lowest point. When the insurrection ended, the wheels of justice began to turn. It will be an expensive ride. They're charging people with everything they can under the United States Code. A WUSA 9 data analysis revealing federal prosecutors have brought more than 50 criminal charges against more than 200 different defendants. Many of the suspects now asking the government they are accused of trying to overthrow for a taxpayer-funded defense attorney, also known as a public defender or court-appointed attorney. The right to a lawyer guaranteed to every criminal defendant in the United States under the Sixth Amendment to the Constitution. The laws that defend these accused rioters were passed in the same house that they're accused of attacking. If you punch irony into Wikipedia, it should show a picture of, of all this going on. So who are you paying to defend? We dug into the court records. The list includes that guy walking through the rotunda with a Confederate flag, the man photographed wearing a Camp Auschwitz sweatshirt, that zip tie guy, the woman who allegedly stole Nancy Pelosi's laptop to sell it to the Russians, Proud Boys, Oath Keepers, even a guy accused of hitting police officers with a baseball bat. In fact, we added it all up, and you might be surprised to learn at least 102 different capital riot suspects have already been given a taxpayer-funded defense attorney, and that number is sure to grow. Bernie Grimm, who worked as a federal public defender for years, told me based on his experience, once you add in the price of all those taxpayer-funded defense attorneys to everything else the public has to pay for, the prosecutors, the investigators, the jurors, the judges, the total price tag for all these trials put together will be eye-popping. We're talking millions of dollars, millions of dollars. So, And it's all going to be taxpayer money. It's all going to be taxpayer money. And the irony of this whole thing is the document that protesters arm themselves with to say, this document says I can come up here, come in the Senate building, but that same document is that document is gonna protect those people. Um, give them a, a right to a trial, a right to a free lawyer, a right to cross-examine, call witnesses. Um, I've never seen anything like it. Justice can be expensive. Glenn Ivey is a former federal prosecutor and the former state's attorney in Prince George's County. Yeah, I know a lot of times the public has mixed feelings about using tax dollars to pay for public defenders or uh, uh, other court appointed attorneys uh, because they don't want to have, you know, defendants get representation on their dime. But, you know, that's the cost of, of having a fair justice system. Uh, in the United States. So of course we wanted to know the total cost of all these public defenders for taxpayers. But here's the thing, the administrative office of the courts, which funds the courts, told us that exact dollar figure won't be known until years down the road. Why? Well, policy prohibits the release of financial information during a case because it can give away court strategies. Is there something poetic about the fact that the government they attacked is gonna do everything it can to protect them in court? Uh, poetic, you, 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 couldn't write, you couldn't write this story. It is, from a constitutional perspective, it's street poetry, it's amazing. After the insurrection at the U.S. Capitol on January 6th, the Department of Justice pledged to hold those responsible accountable. But now a WUSA 9 data analysis finds that out of all the people who pled guilty so far, almost 9 out of 10 will walk away with only a misdemeanor on their record. And that has some in our community upset and questioning whether defendants are getting off easy. Tonight, Chief Investigative Reporter Eric Flack is digging into the guilty pleas and asking the experts, is justice being served? 
From storming the Capitol to standing in front of a judge, the list of January 6 defendants is growing, and so is the backlash at the criminal charges many of them are pleading guilty to. So people were upset? Oh, yeah, I, I got death threats. Death threats after D.C. defense attorney Nabil Kibria represented a couple from Virginia named Joshua and Jessica Bussell, who both pled guilty to misdemeanor charges despite social media posts in which Jessica Bussell wrote, Pence is a traitor, we stormed the Capitol. The judge said he was concerned by those posts, but not enough to send the couple to prison, sentencing each to a few months of house arrest and probation. Do you think justice was served in the Bustles case? I think so. I think justice was served because, again, as I said, these people, I don't think, were there to stop um, the government. I don't, I don't think they were really there to stop the, the certification of the election. The Bustles are far from the only capital right defendants to reach an agreement with the Department of Justice on a low-level guilty plea. A WUSA 9 analysis of the first 110 plea deals agreed to by the government reveals only 17 capital right defendants have pled guilty to felonies. The rest? all misdemeanors. Put another way, just over one out of every 10 January 6 defendants to enter guilty pleas to date face any significant amount of prison time. I think the DOJ has been trying to clear out the, the, the low level, you know, the low hanging fruit, which is the misdemeanors. But some judges presiding over Capitol riot cases are starting to push back. U.S. District Court Judge Emmett Sullivan pressed federal prosecutors in open court about why a Pennsylvania woman was allowed to simply plead guilty to a misdemeanor, despite threats she made to shoot House Speaker Nancy Pelosi in, quote, the friggin' brain. And just this week, Judge Tanya Chuckton went above the DOJ's recommended sentence for Matthew Mazzocco, who pled guilty to a petty misdemeanor charge for being on Capitol grounds January 6th. The DOJ asked for three months of home confinement, the judge ordering the Texas man to serve 45 days in jail instead, saying, quote, there have to be consequences for January 6th. On social media, one Twitter user asked flatly, if the Department of Justice isn't doing the justice part, what's the point? The Department of Justice isn't positioned to try 600 felony cases. It's just not what they do. Former federal prosecutor Niamh Romani believes a lot of this comes down to resources for the United States Attorney's Office of the District of Columbia, who declined to comment on our story. Since January, more than 600 capital riot cases have piled up on the desks of U.S. attorneys in D.C., including at least 185 involving assault on police. Others are charged in widespread felony conspiracy cases for pre-planning the attack including the Oath Keepers, a prosecution with so many defendants. Judges say they may have to split the group into different trials just so the courtrooms can handle all the defendants and attorneys. The Department of Justice is painted into a corner right now by the sheer number of people that they ended up charging. No question, but you have to charge these people. You cannot give people a free pass when they enter the Capitol building unlawfully. So they're trying to strike a balance it is worth keeping in mind that there are those who believe the Department of Justice should not be prosecuting low-level capital riot defendants at all, pointing to arrangements given to some arrested during the George Floyd protests known as deferred prosecution. That's where the government agrees to wipe a guilty conviction off your record if you keep your nose clean for a year or two. No deferred prosecution agreements have been given to capital riot defendants so far. Eric Flack, WUSA 9. To this now, a Virginia man facing some of the most serious criminal charges in the attack on the U.S. Capitol told a judge this. He's a decorated military veteran with top secret security clearance. That bombshell came in newly filed court documents obtained by our chief investigative reporter, Eric Flack. Eric is live with us tonight from that suspect's hometown, Berryville, Virginia. That's in Clark County, about 60 miles outside of D.C. You know, Flack, the defense secretary newly installed said he needs to look at extremism within the ranks and try to root it out. This story is just crazy if it's true. 
Yeah, Longo, it really is. Berryville is a town of about 4,000 people. It is also home to the alleged leader of a paramilitary right-wing organization who is now charged with conspiracy in the attack on the U.S. Capitol. But these newly filed court documents we got our hands on say the now 66-year-old Thomas Caldwell is just a farmer who is also a retired lieutenant commander in the U.S. Navy who's been trusted with government secrets for more more than three decades. Federal prosecutors say this is an image of Thomas Caldwell outside the U.S. Capitol on January 6th. In court filings, investigators accused Caldwell of having a leadership role within the Oath Keepers, claiming he was referred to as Commander Tom by fellow members. The Oath Keepers is a right-wing militia, the FBI says, played a key role organizing the Capitol insurrection. Every single in there is a traitor. Every single one. Caldwell and two other alleged members of the Oath Keepers are charged with a half dozen federal crimes, including conspiracy, allegedly communicating about the attack two weeks before the siege, including this Facebook message on January 1st, in which Caldwell suggests a room at the Comfort Inn in Boston would, quote, allow us to hunt at night. Investigators say the Oath Keepers are focused on recruiting current and former military, law enforcement, and first responders as their members. And in these newly filed court documents, Caldwell's attorney cited his military record to help get the Berryville man released from jail while he awaits trial, telling the judge Caldwell is a retired lieutenant commander from the U.S. Navy. Attorney also claiming Caldwell has held top secret security clearance since 1979 and after retiring from the Navy, briefly worked as a security chief for the FBI and later formed a consulting firm that did classified work for the U.S. government. The attorney also told the judge there is no evidence Caldwell is a member of the Oath Keepers or holds a leadership position in the militia. Now to a WUSA 9 exclusive, brand new reporting on the insurrection at the Capitol and the killing of alleged Capitol rioter Ashley Babbitt. Her family has hired an attorney from Prince George's County to bring a multi-million dollar wrongful death lawsuit against the U.S. Capitol Police Department. And now that attorney is speaking with us. Here's Chief Investigative Reporter Eric Flack. It was a day of chaos, confusion, and violence as rioters stormed the U.S. Capitol January 6th. Through it all, a single gunshot was fired. That bullet killed 35-year-old Air Force veteran Ashley Babbitt. According to the Department of Justice, Babbitt had traveled from California to D.C. to protest the 2020 presidential election results and was among a mob of people that entered the Capitol building and tried to force their way into the speaker's lobby. Was Ashley Babbitt murdered in the eyes of her family? In the eyes of her family, of course she was. I mean, there was just no legal justification to take her life. Last month, the DOJ cleared the unidentified Capitol Police officer who shot Babbitt, finding there was not enough evidence to support a criminal prosecution or that the officer willfully used force that was constitutionally unreasonable. But Terry Roberts, who specializes in police misconduct and civil rights litigation, says the Babbitt family now plans to file a multi-million dollar wrongful death lawsuit against the Capitol Police Department, alleging the Capitol Police officer who killed Babbitt had no right to fire his weapon, hitting her in the shoulder, causing her to fall back from the doorway and down to the floor. She later died at the hospital. She shouldn't have been there. Does the conversation go any farther than that? It goes very much farther than that. Roberts says Babbitt was unarmed, trying to climb through a narrow window next to a door to the speaker's lobby. He claims since Babbitt was facing forward, she could not see the officer, his gun drawn, at a sharp angle to her left. Roberts says Babbitt's view of the officer was further obstructed by a barricade of furniture blocking the door. And although you can hear someone in this video yelling the Capitol Police officer had pulled out his gun. There's a gun! There's a gun! There's a gun! Robert says it was too loud for Babbitt to hear that warning and that his investigative team has interviewed at least six other people who say the officer himself gave no verbal warning of his own before firing. Oh! Oh! I mean, stepping into the speaker's lobby might be unlawful but it doesn't warrant the death penalty. So, you know, we don't, we don't shoot protesters in this country unless they're an immediate threat to somebody. 
The DOJ says it reviewed video of the shooting, evidence from the scene, statements from the officers that were there, as well as the autopsy results from Ashley Babbitt before deciding there was not enough evidence to move forward with a criminal investigation. Eric Flack, WUSA 9. Our chief investigative reporter Eric Flack is live on Capitol Hill for us tonight with more on this developing story. And Flack, I know you got a copy of this letter. And what exactly are these lawmakers talking about here? Hey, so yeah, the letter is right here. And what I want to draw your attention to is a list of 18 questions they have included that they want Attorney General Garland to answer. The tone of these questions clearly indicating that these senators believe there is a double standard when it comes to how the DOJ is prosecuting these Capitol riot defendants as opposed to people who are arrested after the protest, after the death of George Floyd. The four-page letter obtained by WUSA 9 says despite, quote, numerous examples of violence during social justice protests nationwide in 2020, individuals charged with committing crimes at these events may benefit from infrequent prosecutions and minimal, if any, penalties. The letter cites a political report which outlines deals federal prosecutors have struck in a half dozen federal felony cases arising from clashes between protesters and law enforcement enforcement in Oregon. Those agreements known as deferred resolution or deferred prosecution is when the government sets aside and eventually drops a criminal charge in exchange for good behavior or community service. DOJ's apparent unwillingness to punish these individuals stands in stark contrast to the harsher treatment of the individuals charged in connection with the breach of the U.S. Capitol building, the letter states. To date, only two Capitol riot defendants have reached plea agreements with the government with both defendants expected to serve jail time. The letter also takes aim at the DOJ webpage that lists capital riot defendants and charges while, quote, no such database exists for alleged perpetrators of crimes associated with the spring and summer 2020 protests. It is signed by five Republican senators, including Rick Scott of Florida, who said in a statement to WUSA 9, the Department of Justice needs to answer for why there hasn't been an equal administration of justice justice with respect to violent protests that occurred throughout our nation last year. So there was nothing, there's nothing equitable or the same about any of this. April Goggins, core organizer of Black Lives Matter DC, was on the front lines of last year's social justice protests on Black Lives Matter Plaza. She also lives just three miles from the U.S. Capitol. So it's preposterous to say these people are not being treated fairly. Yeah, it's absolutely preposterous. It just, it's a, it's a fairy tale. Um, and, and I think it should be portrayed as such. Like this, they're living in a world that doesn't exist for 99.9% .9 of the population. Um, and clearly so do all the people who believe them. This afternoon, we reached out to Attorney General Garland's office. They declined comment and also did not to provide, provide any specifics on if and when they would be answering these 18 questions submitted by those Republican senators. But if you would like to read those for yourselves, we have them right now on our website, WUSA 9, and our mobile app. Zoe, back to you.